Here we're going to talk about recursion and provide a few C-sharp examples. A recursion is when you have a solution that you use the same call to solve uh, a smaller instance of the same problem. In other words, if one step relies on uh, completing the same function over again for a smaller subset of the problem, uh, this can be a recursive method. An example of something that can be defined recursively, uh, at least for mathematics, there's a couple of good simple examples. Uh, one is this process called factorial. It's uh, defined to be if you take the factorial of n, so uh, n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times etc. Well, if I look at that and if I think of factorial of n, it's n times factorial of n minus 1, which is n times n minus 1 times factorial of n minus 2, etc., all the way down. So it's a recursive function. It's, it's a factorial of a larger number is actually the larger number times the factorial of one less. And so each time through, you're, you're recalling the same definition uh, on a subset or a, a smaller instance of the original problem. Another example of this is the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, these are numbers where each number is the sum of the previous two. So uh, the Fibonacci of the 1, 2, 3, 4, fifth term, the 3 in that sequence, is actually the sum of the Fibonacci sequence for the fourth term and the Fibonacci sequence for the third term. And so uh, each latter stage depends on recalculating or calculating a simpler version of the same thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the factorial uh, function here to, um, to demonstrate how you can uh, uh, work with a recursive function call. Now, we can do what's called an iterative solution. We're familiar with this. This is looping. Uh, iter iteration means to loop through. So an iterative solution for factorial would be as seen here. Uh, you might have a function called factorial. You're going to allow an input variable, which would be an integer here. And uh, you're going to have to have some value um, that's going to store the or accumulate the overall result as you loop through uh, the various terms. So if I loop through and set my initial value to n, uh, then if I do the for loop uh, and each time I multiply the current value times the value of i, so i is going to be n minus 1, then it's going to be n minus 2, then it's going to be n minus 3, then it's going to be n minus 4, all the way down until it's equal to 1, I will accumulate in the value my actual answer and then I'll return the value. So there's a typical iterative solution. And the important thing there is I need this, this value uh, to store my location. It's very explicit in the iterative solution. In the recursive solution, uh, basically I call a version of myself, or uh, the function calls a version of itself. So factorial of n is just defined to be n times factorial of n minus 1. And since that's the same function call, uh, that means that you're just calling factorial over again with one less value, which means that that one would then end up being effectively n minus 1 times factorial of n minus 2. So again, you're calling factorial over again. This process would continue infinitely unless there is a stop condition. Uh, we know that the factorial of 1 is defined to be 1. So if our code is smart and looks to see whether I'm calling it with an input of 1, it can simply return 1. It doesn't need to continue to recurse deeper in. Uh, and we call that a stop condition. So let's uh, show you the code here for the implementation of a recursive version of factorial. Uh, here, I'm expecting an input of n. And I do a few things. I check to see whether it's less than zero. If I do, I throw an exception. Uh, you're not allowed to do a factorial of negative numbers. Uh, if the value is equal to zero, if I'm doing zero factorial, it's just zero. If I'm doing factorial of one, uh, it should just return one. And any other condition, any other value of n, uh, 
I return n times the factorial of n minus 1. So I'm recalling it, uh, the function itself from inside the function. This is recursion. So uh, you'll notice that nowhere in here do I have this value that's accumulating my answer. And that's the that's the trick or the power or the or the mystery or however you want to look at it of recursion is this value gets built up uh, by multiple function calls returning values higher up the chain. And so we're going to demonstrate how that works. Um, remember that this particular line is what we call the termination condition or the stop condition. This is the one that keeps us from uh, recursing forever. And this particular call is known as the recursive call. This is where you call yourself. So how does this thing keep track of the value of, um, of n that it's currently working on and et cetera? Well, uh, we use what's called the call stack. And we're going to talk about the call stack. And I'm going to use a, an example that is not recursive here to begin with. And then we'll show it over again with the recursive version. Uh, the call stack stores the program state information whenever you make a function call. And the thing you store in the program stack is called a stack frame. And a stack frame is uh, like all the local variables, uh, where the function call was made from, uh, uh, and things like that. So that uh, when that function call is done and returns some information, uh, the program knows where, where to go back to. So if we think of the call stack as a stack, and remember, a stack is a data storage location where the last thing put on the stack is the first one coming off the stack. Uh, we can uh, look at a program and a simple program like this, which has got a main and a couple of function calls. As soon as we start the program, the main function is called. So onto the call stack goes the main program uh, stack frame. So this is all the data and all the information about the main function that has been called. But inside that function, uh, of main, I now call function one and pass some arguments to it. So program control gets transferred to function one, and as soon as function one is, is, is called, a stack frame for the current status of function one is pushed onto the call stack. This stack frame contains the return information of where to go back or where this function was called from so that it can return the value back to the main function. It also contains values of local variables. And for here, you'll notice that I have n defined in both functions. Uh, the n inside of function 1 is the, fun is the variable local to here. So it's being handled inside of this stack frame. Well, inside of function 1, I call function 2. So as soon as function 2 it takes control, a stack frame is pushed onto the stack that contains all the information about function 2. Uh, function 2 now does something, doesn't, re doesn't call any new functions. So it actually has a valid return value. It's the square of this input value. And so that means that function 2 is ending. And so when it finishes, it returns a value back to function 2 and is popped off the call stack. So now the function, when, it, when it's ended, it returns control back to the previous stack frame. So the previous stack frame here is function 1. And when function 1 now has a value, because it returned, got function 2's value, it can now return that. And so it is going to pop off the stack and return control back to the main program, where it was originally called function 1. And, uh, and that's how a call stack works. So in the case of recursive calls, here's our, here's our recursive function. And I'm going to call it with an initial value of 4. So um, the main stack frame gets popped on, or pushed onto the stack when the main function calls. And it is going to call factorial of 4. So a copy factorial 4 stack frame gets pushed on there. And the actual value inside there return n times factorial of n minus 1 means that it's going to have a value of 4 times and it's going to wait for the answer of factorial 3. So factorial 3 is another function call, so it gets pushed onto the stack uh, as a stack frame for factorial 3, which again, that, that return line is going to be n times, and now it's going to wait for 
the value of factorial 2. So it's going to call factorial 2 again, pushing it back onto the frame. So now uh, factorial 2 is waiting to be 2 times the, whatever the value of factorial n minus 1 is again, which in this case is factorial 1. And we end up with factorial 1 being called. Well, factorial 1 has a termination condition. If n is equal to 1, just return 1. No additional deeper recursion is required, which means that factorial 1 takes on the value now of 1. So factorial 1 is now complete, so it pops off the stack, and the value 1 is returned back to the waiting function, waiting factorial 1 here. And so it can now calculate 2 times 1 and get a value of 2. So this particular call is now has a value of 2. Again, it's complete, so it pops off the stack, has a value of 2 that's returned to waiting factorial 2. 2 times 3 is 6. This one completes. It now pops off the stack. The value 3 is returned back up or down, whichever way you want to think of it, the stack, to the waiting factorial 3. This takes on the value of 24. That function call is now complete and now returns the value back to the main program. And so our, our integer uh, variable called value now takes on the value 24. You can see how recursive calls work. Uh, some of the advantages of recursive um, programming is that the code is extremely simple to read usually. Um, recursion is uh, often uh, less complicated to build in terms of the structure of the actual code. Uh, sometimes the interpretation of how the code is operating gets a little confusing because uh, it's not a it's not an explicit loop that you see, but it effectively becomes a loop. Um, uh, there's not any particular uh, performance advantage to using recursion because pushing those stack frames on uh, and off um, can you know can have some overhead. So it's kind of the kind of whichever way you prefer, uh, but it is a very effective way to design certain types of, of functions.